Good morning and welcome to the 28th meeting of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee in 2024. I have received apologies for this meeting from David Torrance, Andrew Maguire and Gordon MacDonald is attending as a substitute. Um, as agenda item one, I would like to start by welcoming Brian Whittle, MSP, to the committee who is replacing Tess White. Um, and the first item on our agenda is to ask Brian to declare any relevant interests. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, the only interest uh, I, can, I would uh, confirm is that I have a, a daughter who is uh, an NHS healthcare professional. Thank you, and welcome to the committee, Brian. The second item on our agenda is to agree to take agenda items 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 in private. Are members agreed? Thank you. The next item on our agenda is an evidence session as part of our scrutiny of the independent review of gender identity services for children and young people in England and Wales, otherwise known as the CAS review, and implications of the review for provision of these services in Scotland. And I welcome to the committee Professor Sir Gregor Smith, Chief Medical Officer, Professor Graeme Ellis, Deputy Chief Medical Officer, and Professor Alison Strath, Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, Scottish Government. And we'll move straight to questions. And Carol Mohan. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, and thank you for coming to the committee. I wonder if I could just open. You will know um, that we had Dr Cass along at the committee. She provided a very full, professional, very caring um, update to us about the cash review. The government have accepted um, the cash review in full. Um, and in a statement the minister um, brought to parliament, she talked about the work that we needed to do to make sure that we were um, providing the best care for, for the young people involved in this. She talked about a task and finish group, and I wondered whether you could update us um, on what that actually means at the moment and what work, um, is, you know, what the stage of the work is at. I suppose, are, are we complete or do we still have um, things that we need to do and, and what the time frame might be around those things? So why don't I begin to answer your question and then bring colleagues in there just now. So, so, so you're right, um, the, the, the cash review, um, and, and I have to say, um, I agree with your assessment that, that Hilary Cass is a very caring, compassionate individual who has completed a review in, in quite challenging circumstances, I have to say, but uh, which is, is really important in terms of how we begin to take gender identity services forward, not just in NHS England, but actually as relevance across the UK as well. That's why um, I, I asked um, my, my deputy. Um, uh, Professor Ellis here, and accompanied by a multidisciplinary team that included Professor Strath uh, to my right here, to begin to look at the implications for NHS Scotland. Now, when you talk about a task and finish group, I think you're talking about a separate group from the multidisciplinary team who made, who assessed those recommendations um, that were contained within the CAS report and looked at their relevance for Scotland. Since then, um, there's been further work um, that has been taken on. Uh, by the Chief Operating Officer's Directorate in Scottish Government, which lies separate from the work um, which um, Professor Ellis and Professor Strath were involved in, which begins to look at the service models for the future and begins to put those in place. Now, my understanding of that work, although I'm not involved in that work at this moment in time, um, my understanding is that that work is progressing um, under the, some of the, the reform programme that um, Mr Burns and his uh, directorate are leading just now. now uh, Professor Ellis may want to say a little bit more about any involvement he's had in, in, in that at this moment in time, but um, uh, at the moment I, I can't really say any more than that. Do, would it be helpful if I indicated some things that I've, I've read that were part of what the, uh, the recommendations were around um, health care services for young people no longer being provided in adult settings, um, a sort of a distributive network, um, and the other key one was the end to self referrals with access through a uh, clinician led referrals. Is that some of the work that has been going on? Yeah, and these were the recommendations that we made in the report, certainly. And uh, as Professor Smith has said, the Chief Officer's Director, who is responsible for planning and delivering services, including some of the more vulnerable and fragile services that need to be provided on a network model across Scotland, uh, are taking over the kind of implementation phase. So they have appointed a chair, they have a terms of reference for the group, and the Short Life Working Group will meet over a matter of months, I'm not sure the exact time scale, to make sure that they are able to implement and deliver this distributed model. 
uh, which means that we can provide care more immediately and closer to home where possible. There's a lot of logistics to be worked through in that, but I expect that they'll be working through that over the next few months. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Convener. Thank you. Mr Fitzpatrick. Thanks very much. Um, th thanks for coming along and giving evidence. I wasn't here actually when um, Dr Cass uh, gave evidence, um, so I haven't directly heard that evidence. But uh, around the cash review, there's been a, a fair degree of controversy around the methodology, um, um, none, none least than most lately from the, the BMA. So I wonder if you can give us your position, CMO, on the, the methodology employed by the cash review and maybe comment on the, the, the work of the BMA review and how the government will respond to that review once it's published. So the first thing to say to you is I think probably everyone in this room would recognise that there was um, a, a controversial moment, as you say, when, when the BMA uh, decided that they were going to... Um, uh, begin their own critique of the cash review at that point in time. Now, my understanding of the reasoning behind why they chose to do that was, was based on two papers um, that had been identified and which um, were, were critical of the methodology which uh, was employed by, by Cass during her review. Um, I think the first thing I would say to you is it's been very striking to me that the BMA has moved back from that position now, uh, following quite a um, a marked um, uh, representation from their members and from other um, clinicians and scientists who were, were, were critical of the approach that the BMA had taken. Now, the two papers in question here, which the BMA had identified, uh, which were critical of the methodology, uh, McNamara and um, I think it was Nolan was the other paper. These were two papers published online, um, have since been critiqued by... Um, uh, other uh, very credible scientists, and um, I, I have to say that the, the credibility of those two papers published online, and which I think were very important, not peer-reviewed, in fact one was essentially um, a blog and opinion rather than any research paper, uh, but they were critiqued through normal scientific process and, and, and the credibility was undermined quite significantly as a consequence of that. Uh, which I think has also contributed to the change in the BMA position in relation to their own approach that they're going to take here. Um, there's a wonderful paper which I could send you the link for, if you like, which, which looks at those two papers and begins to critique those and looks at the, the flaws in, in the way that they've approached things, the misunderstanding of what the, cra the, the, the cash review actually was. Uh, we've got to remember the cash review was an independent review. It's something that we've been used to doing in the UK for many years, is appointing a respected individual to conduct an independent review that takes a, evidence from a number of different sources. It's not a clinical, pros, a, a clinical practice guideline. And, and, and I think that there was, and certainly in one of the papers, a, a, a real misunderstanding of what the cash review had set out to do and what the terms of reference for the cash review, hence the application or, or, or some of the, the, uh, the comments about the methodology. But even that said, um, the, the, there, was, there was, from what I've seen, um, really quite marked flaws within the way that these two papers approached um, that critique of, of, of CAS. And we can go into that in more detail, um, if, if you so wish. Um, one of the things I think is really important at this point in time is about understanding scientific process. Scientific process is really important. Scientific process is one of the elements of human society that has allowed us to make such progress in the way that we understand the society that we live in, but also the way that we go about treating um, or developing clinical practice. There needs to be a rigour with it. And we need to be very careful how we begin to use, interpret, or um, begin to um, report um, research papers which don't follow that type of um, rigour and due scientific process, because it undermines the progress that we make as, a, as, as, as humanity um, if, if we fail to do that. And unfortunately, there, there is much that has been written round about gender identity services, round about the CAS um, uh, review itself, which, which doesn't have that scientific rigour that, that, that we need to be mindful of 
when we're thinking about complex subjects like that. That said, we need more science in this area. We need more research in this area. Um, the guys beside me can speak a little bit more about some of the, the developments in that space to try and develop some of that evidence and science around about this. But it needs to be proper scientific process that is followed, uh, both in the interpretation of any commentary, but also in, in, in the way that we approach uh, the, the development of evidence in this space. If it is to be useful, truly useful, both to the people who are seeking seeking this type of service, uh, but also the clinicians who are using it. Professor Ellis or, or Professor Schaff may want to expand yeah, a little bit. With their own. Like um, yeah, no, I would completely agree with that. And I think at the heart of the debate around this is the fact that the studies that exist are observational studies. They're poor quality. They're very prone to potential bias. And that leaves them open to interpretation at the heart of this. There isn't enough rigorous scientific experimental studies that rule out bias so that you can trust the results that are there. And that's what we need. And we've agreed to take part in the UK uh, research trial on puberty blockers as part of a, a UK-wide consortium. And, and I think that that will be important in understanding and informing the evidence base without that risk of bias and interpretation. And I might just add in that I suppose, and it really, I suppose, reiterates what um, my colleagues have said, that um, not all evidence is equal. And normally we look at evidence in kind of four different ways. So the, the best evidence you can get is a randomised controlled trial, and that really gives the rigour that's been described earlier. Um, after that, you can have um, sort of various other different levels in terms of thinking about systematic reviews, which look at the literature that's published, that's been peer-reviewed. You can have case study approaches and then you have more of the kind of observational study, which has much less rigour. So it is making sure we get that balance of the evidence right that I think is really important. And that's what really drives, I guess, decisions we make, for example, around um, you know, whether to licence a medicine or not. It's very much based on that kind of strong evidence based from random, randomised controlled trials. And are either Professor Ellis or Professor Strath able to give us an indication of the timescales for the, the trials ongoing? I think people will be really keen to hear how that's progressing. Yeah, so, uh, the trial is set up and funded, and it, it will have five component parts, of which the randomised control trial is one part. It plans to start recruiting at the beginning of next year, and Scotland's involvement has been confirmed, um, but when we start sending patients or involving patients, I don't know yet exactly. Thank you. Sanders Gohani. Just uh, a reminder of my declaration of interest as a practicing NHS GP. Uh, good morning, Professor Smith. Um, it, you said today um, that we need to see more evidence uh, in, in the area. Um, you've also uh, said previously, uh, after initial multifaceted, sorry, uh, the CAS review highlighted uh, that the evidence for prescribing gonadotrophin releasing hormone analogs to suppress puberty is inadequate and the risk of short or long term harm remains uncertain. Um, so my question to you is why we were allowed to have a position where medication like this was given to children, which, according to your own words, um, is uncertain and there's inadequate knowledge about. So... As, as you will know, as a, um, as a practising clinician, um, the evidence develops all the time. Sometimes uncertainty begins to develop around a particular approach. And um, the use of medicines in, in any sphere um, is governed by, as you know, um, strict processes, licensing, um, uh, particularly by the MHRA. Professor Strath may want to say a little bit more about this process um, after I've completed them. Um, but, but, but up until the point uh, at which um, then my HRA had, uh, or the literature, actually the, the, the starting point for this was probably a, a literature review which was um, initiated by NICE, uh, looking at the, the, the evidence that surrounded the use of um, GNRH um, uh, analogues. Uh, until that point, um, it was really uncertain just what the evidence base was uh, that, uh, that, that sat around about them. When NICE looked at this, um, they, they, they began to, 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 to kind of see that, the, that there wasn't a strong evidence base one way or another for this, either for the use or um, against the use of it. And the MHRA began to consider this as well following that. Now, Alison may want to say just a little bit about that process just now. Um, but obviously, MHRA, up until that point, um, whilst they, um, 
they, 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 they were content with the use of it. Um, they, they had made the decision following a review of the evidence um, that it should no longer be used in that scenario. And Alison, do you want to say just a little bit more? Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, and and I, th I wonder if it's helpful to start with the bit around licensing first and foremost, and, and I think you'll probably appreciate some of this with your background, but um, the MHRA are responsible for licensing medicines. They do that based on evidence from randomised controlled trials, and they will think about the quality, the safety and the efficacy of those medicines. Um, and that's important because we know before we had a licensing system um, that harm was done to people because we didn't have processes to make those decisions appropriately, but also to keep them under review. And that's why the pharmacovigilance work that the MHRA do, where they look at kind of real world evidence, is also really important. Um, when it comes to um, prescribing, um, obviously we expect clinicians to prescribe a licensed product. Um, but there are times when they will prescribe something what we would call off-label, so that's outside of its, of its licence. And that tends to happen particularly in um, paediatrics because we quite often don't do clinical trials in young people, as you can understand um, why. So we tend to try and translate information from randomised controlled trials and think about the age and weight of a child and, and kind of make those kind of correlations. So uh, it's not unusual to see off-label prescribing. And I, I think we've had a lot of, and I, I know having spoken to some of the young people um, um, impacted by the decisions made about um, availability of, of, um, of GNRH analogues for, pu for puberty suppression, we know from young people that they, you know, they, they use the kind of argument about these products are licensed for things like pernicious um, uh, Thank you. I've got pernicious anemia in my head for some reason <laughs> for, for precocious um, puberty. Um, and, and the thing is, they have been tested in that particular situation. So um, what we haven't done is test them in terms of different uses, um, in terms of different doses and strengths in different age groups. So it is really important that we make these decisions based on the evidence that we have. And that's why the clinical trial is so important in terms of building that evidence base. <laughs> and this is where we are right now. But my question goes back to when the services were set up, when things were beginning, where money has been spent in creating uh, a service. So explain to me what randomised control trial, um, what quality and safety, in, in your own words, said that the, pres the prescribing of GNRH to children was acceptable and safe in this case. I suspect that the issue is local decisions were made using local governance processes um, based on um, the best available evidence, and that's not unusual. But the point is, I guess, when we the, the key thing is that we review these things and we look at the evidence and we ensure that actually we continue to reflect on whether that's appropriate or not. And I think some of the emerging evidence from the work that Dr. Cass did, um, did start to expose that, as did the evidence review that, um, that, that NICE have undertaken. So I think that emerging evidence base is what made people reflect on decisions that were made through governance processes around off-label prescribing. I, I, we had a specialist advisor um, to, to CMO for a period of time, and I always remember him saying to me, the worst thing we do is, effect, is this, accept a poorer medicine into clinical practice. So the point is reviewing these things is really important so that we actually can learn as we're, as we're using things in the real world and, and apply that kind of developing evidence based to our decision making. And I think that's exactly what's happened in this situation. I mean, it's not really because it was England that decided to do the CAS review. It wasn't us. And the emerging evidence didn't push us into thinking, should we have a pause? Should we have a think about where we are and launch... Uh, work. It was England that did that, and we have followed off on the back of that. So I don't necessarily think that is exactly the case. Um, but um, Professor back? Strath, C could I come back on that point? Because yes. I think it's important at this point just to say that um, from the from the moment that um, there, there was um, evidence of, of a review which was going to begin to take place, we were engaged with NHS England in terms of watching that review take place, making sure that we were engaging with Dr Cass herself over the process of that review. And um, I, I think it's um, 
probably just slightly misrepresents the, the, the history of the situation to say uh, that we weren't involved in those discussions or watching to see what recommendations uh, Dr Cass would make at that point in time. I think it's really important to say that right from the beginning, um, clinicians in Scotland and, and, and officials um, who were um, around about um, gender identity services and responsible for them uh, on policy terms were, were very much part of that process and watching very closely what Dr Cass was doing to look at the relevance for Scotland right from the beginning. In a, in a devolved health service, we are watching and we didn't do anything to start it off. But my final question, um, Dr, um, sorry, Professor Strath, could you please give us an update on where we are with the current research and the, the current um, indications to find out what is happening and do you know roughly, and it's always difficult to tell, I appreciate it with any trials, but roughly when we will see an update? I think colleagues have already discussed the fact that we have, we've engaged and our chief scientist um, for health in Scottish Government has actively engaged with her counterparts at the department. We're going to participate in the NIHR, National Institute of Health and Care Research um, clinical trial and so and that will begin at the turn of this year and as, as um, my colleague Professor Ellis said we don't know exactly the start date for, the, for that in terms of recruitment actively to patients but that will be one of the key things in terms of that emerging evidence base. Now there will be work happening elsewhere um, and we are actively engaged with uh, Glasgow University who are doing quite a lot of work in terms of that kind of ongoing research around um, the services we're providing in this space, but also looking, I guess, across, across globally around you know, what that developing evidence base is. So I think the key thing is, um, as part of the NIHR trial, we'll start to see, from a UK perspective, that emerging evidence, but we also need to think about what's, what evidence is coming from elsewhere, and that will play through into the overall thinking. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Good morning to you. So just to pick up on that point, actually, about international collaboration, working together. We're talking about a small number of, of p persons that are seeking um, care in, in terms of gender. And um, I know that in, like, in my previous job as a registered nurse, I would look out to what they were doing in England, Ireland, Wales, when I worked in California, same thing. You network with people who are specialists. So, so as part of that, I'm just thinking that that would be part of engagement, is already networking with people who are providing specialist care, um, you know, researchers, doctors, whatever. So I would imagine that is what uh, Dr. Gregor Smith, you're actually talking about is the you know we're not just waiting and watching in Scotland for somebody else to take action. Participation and collaboration has been ongoing right from the start. It would be a real mistake to see or to or to adopt a, a, an isolationist position in in world clinical medicine. Um, if we were to look inwardly and only inwardly, rather than actually um, being able to utilise. Um, the very strong professional networks that we have both across the UK and internationally to learn from others' experience, to bring back good practice, to be able to um, learn from other people's uh, reviews and um, approaches to care. If, if we were to do, uh, if we were to fail to do that, we, we, it, would, it, would, it would be incorrect for us. Uh, we need to make sure that we are engaging with experts uh, from a variety of different countries, both across the UK but also internationally, to learn from their experience. And what um, I, I um, see happened um, over the course of this, as you say, in what was a very specialised service, um, was, was that with, with CAS uh, conducting her review of services in England, there was always an anticipation um, that there would be learning from it, which would be directly and highly relevant to the way that we approach services in Scotland. And as you can see from the report, which my colleagues here have produced, there, there's a, there, there is a number of um, recommendations from the CAS report which have um, either full relevance or, or, or at least partial relevance to the situation in Scotland. I think there was only six recommendations that CAS made uh, which didn't have some form of relevance to the way that we provide care uh, to people uh, in Scotland. OK, thanks. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Kavina. Good, good morning to the panel. Can I just say I'm, I'm late into this uh, investigation, so if I my question cut across some things that have been uh, dealt with before, uh, my apologies. But I think... Um, 
I was very interested in what you said, uh, Professor Smith, around the, the, the scientific vigorous of the scientific process and how important that is, and I completely agree with that. Also, within the CAST report, it commented on a uh, uh, come in. It also commented on the social transition uh, in schools is not a neutral act, and I wonder because it, it, it sort of concerns me having spoken to on a previous uh, um, committee around the uh, teachers. I mean, they're often at the front line in terms of uh, recognising the potential for uh, uh, maybe some, some sort of um, medical assessment, medical intervention or uh, issues with, or, or with youngsters seeking professional uh, or, or medical advice. Should we or are we looking at um, updating school guidance in terms of uh, giving the tools to our teachers to be able to recognise uh, issue and be able to um, signpost towards you know, uh, potential help. So I'm going to pass to one of my colleagues. I'm going to profess, uh, pass to Professor Ellis in just a little second, just just to come back and see how they considered some of those wider issues um, in relation to, to the development of services. But but I think one of the principles here, which I would want to highlight and want to, um, to, to to make members of the committee really aware of, was um, I think one of the strongest considerations that came through both of the CAS. Uh, report, uh, but, but also subsequently Professor Ellis and the multidisciplinary team's response to that CAS report was, was, was about the, the striking need to ensure that when we think about care for, for, for this group of young people, um, that we think about care that's been delivered not by an individual, although it may have to be led and coordinated by an individual, but from a wide variety of professionals who are involved. And this is this is this is because of the, very often what we see the the, the, the sheer complexity of um, some of the the, the, the other um, uh, conditions. Um, or neurodevelopmental disorders um, that that young person may also experience at the same time. So it would be, um, I think, um, from here on in, a mistake for us to think about any one clinician practising in isolation here. Um, we need a very holistic approach to the way that we approach um, providing care and support uh, to, to these young people. And um, I think that does extend beyond traditional health care services as well. Certainly in terms of a multidisciplinary team, for me, there's a need to make sure that we've got many professionals who are working together, both across uh, specialists in, 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 in neurodevelopmental disorders, but also in, in mental health support and, 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 and gender identity. And, and some of the issues that relate to endocrine use itself as well. So, so all of that needs to work hand in hand. But the wider the group of people that there are who are able to support and recognise some of the, the broad issues that can affect any young person, um, the, the, the better. Now, as I say, Professor Ellis may want to expand on that and some of the considerations that the group had, uh, but, but I would certainly support that wider societal response. I would also, just to say one last thing, I think we all have a responsibility. I think we all need to be very, very careful about the way that we enter dialogue in this space because, as Cass has said and as others have commented, this, this, this is an area of um, experience and clinical practice where there are very polarised views. And sometimes the debate and the discussion which goes on round about it um, can be very difficult for people, both those who experience um, um, issues with the gender identity, but also uh, for clinicians who are providing care in this space. I think um, to be able to, to kind of uh, create a, a much more balanced approach to the way that we discuss these services and these issues uh, is something which we have to move towards in the future. But Professor Ellis may want to say something more specifically about your question. Yeah, no, thank you. I, and, and I think. I think this is a difficult area and there are no easy answers to that. Um, one of the things that I found really striking in speaking to one of the psychologists providing this service was the analogy that she made with enabling the public and the teachers in other areas to be able to talk about things like suicide, making it a safe space for people to talk about difficult subjects. And I think this is one of those areas where we need to be equipping people to be able to talk about the difficult things. But I think the important point is that it needs to be a, a supportive and multidimensional response to an individual child's needs. These children often have multiple other needs. Um, from waiting list data that we have from Glasgow, one in 
One in four have other medical needs. One in five, sorry, one in three have a diagnosis of a mental health condition, and two out of three have a neurodevelopmental condition diagnosed or waiting to be diagnosed. So they have multiple needs, but we need to be able to see and accept them and create an environment in which they can thrive, but also allow them to feel safe to talk about these kind of questions in a, in a safe environment. And, and I think that early multidisciplinary response um, to support children and families address questions and address the wider range of needs alongside their questions about gender is really important. Thank you. And I was just going to add possibly that we have some experience already from the work we've been doing in areas such as fetal, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. So we've got some of those links in with the education system and I think there's a lot for us to build on in terms of that kind of holistic approach that colleagues have just described. So I think there's there's positive steps in that direction and I definitely think it's you know something we, we will be able to build on because of that kind of, you know developing area in terms of neurodiversity and the role within schools etc. Thank you. Gordon McDonald. Thanks very much convener. Good morning panel. Uh, I've got a number of questions I want to ask you about um, the ban on private prescribing. Now, I'm, I'm new to the committee and I should also mention that my wife's an NHS nurse before I forget. Um, I'm aware that the legislation uh, on the regulation of medicines is reserved to Westminster and that the previous UK government introduced uh, the emergency legislation to ban the prescribing of puberty uh, blockers. Does the panel's, what's the panel's view on the UK government's ban on private, private prescriptions for puberty blockers? Who wants to come on? Yeah. I'll, I'll possibly start. So yeah. um, you're absolutely right in terms of the, the, the legislation is reserved. Yeah. And I think the concerns that the government at the time had was around how we ensured the appropriate um, safety checks and balances were in the system. And that was very difficult to do, not so much from private prescribing in the UK, but for private prescribing from other parts. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that that's an issue in other areas, not just in this area. Um, so I think their view was to, to, to take in an emergency ban, which was a time-limited ban, um, to, allow, to allow them to reflect and think about what's the best thing to do as we go forward and ensure that the right um, safety nets are in there uh, in terms of any decision-making. That emergency ban was extended for a further period of time, and there's now been a consultation, as you know, on uh, a permanent ban. And I think as part of that, it is, it is looking to ensure that we actually... We understand some of the risks and benefits um, of, of having a, a, you know, a, a kind of process by which decisions are made with a framework that has good governance around it, where we actually know the, the healthcare professionals who are involved in prescribing and making decisions about these, about these medicines. So I, I think on, my view on reflection is that it probably was something that um, allowed, allowed processes and systems to be put in place and also allowed a period of consultation um, with appropriate bodies around what the best next steps will be. Now, my understanding is that consultation is now closed and we're waiting for an analysis of the conclusions of that. And that will then um, drive, I guess, the next steps in terms of what happens around the availability or not of these medicines. So, j just on one of the points you, you mentioned um, about um, private prescriptions coming from abroad purchased over the internet, uh, my understanding is that prior to the ban coming in, if you had started on medication that would be continued. Uh, do you think there's clear guidance on the extent of community pharmacists' responsibilities when asked to continue to dispense privately prescribed puberty blockers? So there are various, you're, you're absolutely right, there are some rules around what prescriptions can and can't be accepted. Um, and and it, guidance has been issued on that, on that point to all healthcare professionals in primary care. Um, it's something which we continually consider around, um, you know, how to improve that. And we work closely with the pharmacy regulator and the pharmacy professional body and also the body that represents community pharmacy owners to make sure that we, we are exploring all those avenues to make sure that people understand what the limitations are and what they can and can't do within the legislative um, changes. So, you know, we continue to keep that under review, but as far as, as I'm aware, we haven't had any, any particular issues or problems. 
we don't really have any knowledge about the extent of that private prescribing from Europe because it's not captured anywhere like we do in, in NHS prescribing through our NHS systems. So it's, it, I, it's difficult to know exactly the impact of it, but we think it's relatively small from, from, um, uh, from, from I suppose, estimations of, of uh, uh, evidence that's come in from individuals that have kind of represented uh, or made, made representations on access. So, so just to be clear, so I've got it straight in my head, if somebody goes into a community pharmacy with a private prescription to be fulfilled, is there not, no record of where it's originated from? The will keep form? a record, but right, that's okay. not actually... It's in their pharmacy written down in a book, so it's not openly It's not gathered accessible. centrally. Yes, absolutely, it's not right, gathered okay. centrally. Just so I got that clear. Now, you mentioned the time limit, and you quite rightly identified that that's been extended from... Um, the 3rd of September to the 26th of November. Um, are there any plans to extend that further beyond that date? As far as I'm aware, the consultation on the permanent ban will be the, the decision that's made. So if, if, if that decision is to introduce a permanent ban, that will supersede the temporary ban. If the decision is not to introduce a permanent ban, then I suspect the, you know, that ban will be lifted. Right, OK. And <clears throat> before the ban, the original ban was enacted, what consultation took place between the Scottish and UK governments about it? Uh, we were informed um, by UK government that they were considering the temporary ban, and we, and because it's reserved legislation, um, we're, we're not really able to. So there was no that consultation. There wasn't, there wasn't a consultation. No. No. Right. Okay. And the new health secretary, West Streeting, has committed to take forward plans for establishing a clinical study to gather the necessary evidence to inform future care and treatment. Has there been any consult consultation with the Scottish Government about that? So, so if I can answer that one, that's the trial that we've referred to. So Scottish colleagues have been observers on the development of that trial before the point at which we have uh, had the review and so on published. Um, and we will be participating in that trial. So it's the same trial that's been discussed by previous administrations. Okay, thanks very much, Convener. Thank you. Gillian Mackay. Thanks, Convener, and good morning to the panel. The panel will be aware that there's been a petition in the Scottish Parliament to end the pause on uh, prescribing puberty blockers to children. In relation to that specific request of the petition, to what extent do doctors have any discretion as part of the current pause on prescriptions to, to issue new prescriptions out with the planned clinical research? I, at this moment in time, um, doctors, I'm afraid, do not have discretion to, to issue prescriptions beyond that, that pause which has been put in place by MHRA and which has also been agreed uh, within Scotland as well. That's great. Um, Professor Smith, part of the allegations by the petitioner are that the decision to pause prescriptions is ideologically driven, given it's not unusual, as we heard earlier, for paediatric treatments, including the use of antipsychotics, to be used off-label by, um, by doctors. How would you respond to those allegations? And do you believe that this is a service that should be there um, for children and young people? So, Professor Strath may want to say just a little bit about the MHRA process here, which was um, about the, the... She's referred to, actually... Uh, in the previous um, questions uh, in our evidence session today, uh, which is about how the decision was taken by MHRA uh, on the basis of available evidence just now to, to make that pause. Yeah, so I suppose um, the, the key thing for me is that whilst there is the opportunity to prescribe medicines generally off-label, I think what um, the evidence that came through from the literature searches that supported Dr Cass's review, along with her, her report, I think pointed to that kind of balance of harm and benefit. Um, and therefore, and, and I think one of the key points she made was that actually we might be doing more harm and we might actually not be researching medicines that might be more beneficial for young people or looking across a range of options that might be more beneficial if we're too polarised in our thinking. So I think there's something for me about whilst the ability previously was there to prescribe medicines off-label, I think the evidence as, it, as it's emerged from the work that's been happening um, makes us say, well, at, 
you know, is, is that still the right thing to continue to do? And, and actually what we don't want to do is, is cause more harm than we do bring benefit. So I think there is something around the opportunity that the clinical trial provides, that, that ongoing kind of uh, review of the evidence and the research and that looking globally across, um, across the kind of uh, what's happening around the world. I think all of that gives us the opportunities to make sure we make those right decisions as we go forward. I mean, I, I think there is something around... Um, putting the kind of needs of young people at the centre of what we're doing in this, but also applying that evidence-based approach around, you know, that harm and risk benefit. Can I say one, just just, just one more uh, further thing, which I think is um, an important aspect of your question uh, as well. Um, as part of your question, you, you asked specifically whether there was an ideology rather than um, science that, that, that lay behind the, this particular approach. Now, in any of the discussions that I've been part of, I've never seen evidence of that of, of an ideology driving this, but I've seen evidence of um, a, a real desire to, to, to get to the bottom of scientific process about where the evidence lies, either in support or, 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 or against the use of these drugs and try to determine fully just what impacts they have, both beneficially but also harmfully, in, in, in this patient group. So I've never seen any ideology that, that, that's actually been behind the, as the driver uh, for, for any decisions in this space from anyone that I've had any conversations with. I've spoken to some um, trans young people, and this comes back to your points earlier on, Professor Strath, about how they can't understand why some young people are able to be prescribed puberty blockers for precocious puberty when they can, when trans young people can't have them, given that they don't feel that they're that much different to their peers who are able to be prescribed these. Could you give me some insight as to what, why we are at the point we're at and why this um, is having to go ahead in terms of this, um, this research? I suppose the key thing is we haven't tested in the age groups that we're treating and with the dosages we're treating, they haven't been tested in the way that the medicines that are licensed for use um, have been. And so it is really important that when we're looking at that, we actually are understanding whether there's any kind of additional harm that's caused, whether the actual product, the, the doses that we're using are actually efficient and effective. So it's really important, as, as we would think about as we license the medicine, we apply that same rigour to our thinking around, um, around when we're using a medicine in a circumstance where it's not licensed. And I think it goes back to the point that if we just rely on using medicines off-label and we don't think about how we, um, I, I suppose, consider the ways to incentivise further research into this area to find better medicines that might actually have less risk of harm, then you know, we end up in that situation where we probably are not um, providing the best care that we can. So I think it's really important that, you know, in thinking about off-label prescribing, it doesn't always necessarily mean to say it's wrong, but there is something about considering it within the circumstances and what the evidence told us from the CAST review that says there may, there may be more harms and things that we don't know about because we haven't done that rigorous scientific kind of review of, of the evidence and, and what the benefits are. If you, Clinical trials go through various phases, um, so we probably know these medicines are, 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 are kind of r relatively safe, but not necessarily in the kind of way that we're using them until we've tested them um, uh, you know, in, in different ways with different ages and with different strengths. So I think there's something for me about this is an opportunity for us to take stock and actually think about how to better target um, invest, uh, uh, research in, the, in this area so that we have the most appropriate treatments available. And just one final question, if I've got time. Thanks, Convener. Um, just to build on some of what Gordon MacDonald asked about earlier on, there were other, obviously some young people who were very close to being prescribed um, either puberty blockers, hormones, or both. When, when this um, pause came into effect, and there will be others who are going through the system, and we'll come to that point, um, potentially when the pause is still, is still in place, to what extent is there monitoring going on of potentially these young people accessing black market medications um, because they don't feel that they, they can wait for this pause to be to be resolved? And how are we monitoring the resulting harm, both in terms of that potential use of, of black market um, medication, but also the harm to those young people who were given uh, a pathway that they anticipated resulting one way and has come to a conclusion in a way that they were not necessarily prepared for? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I, 
Professor, I know Professor Strath will want to make comment on this, but 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 I think when 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 medicines are accessed in this way, now it doesn't matter f what from whatever the purpose of the medicine is, uh, uh, by its very nature, uh, the black market is incredibly difficult to to be able to assess the, any impacts of on, on how people are using it. It's 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 a very hidden aspect of care, and even the fact that if if people choose to try to um, access medicines in that way, they, 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 they're, they're much more likely to covertly use them and, and not to reveal their use as well. So, so monitoring any impact in that space becomes incredibly challenging as a, a result of it. Um, as I say, Professor Strath may want to say a little bit more generally about medicines and um, the, 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 the ability these days to be able to access them through um, newer and less traditional Roots and and some of the the impacts that that um, has across a broad range of care because this is an issue which doesn't just relate to this particular condition but 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 actually um, when you when you think about it it's it's the, there is a much broader um, risk and impact to society. Yes, I, and I guess there's two points to this. Um, first of all, I, I, part of the reason why the UK government put in place the sort of banning order that they did was to try and restrict some of that potential black market access, um, but it won't restrict it all. Um, but but I, I, th I think, you know, one of the key... Can I just interrupt you there? What problem then do we think that the prohibition, com like complete pause and complete inaccessibility even in private prescriptions, could actually drive more of those young people going to non-traditional methods rather than potentially having that oversight of clinicians and that monitoring for from clinicians in the first place? I suppose the issue would be that um, the people who were receiving treatment through the NHS or privately within the UK, um, there was an idea around, and we, you know, we were able to, you could track particular numbers around that. The issue is, I guess, where people were, where it was coming already from, from other parts of, of Europe and beyond. Um, and I guess the concerns were around then how you ensure, as I said before, that we've got the kind of quality and monitoring and controls in there, which which we couldn't do from from that. We we don't have a jurisdiction um, beyond the UK in terms of um, in terms of that that process. I mean, I think the key thing is um, this just doesn't impact um, on the use of GnRH analogues. We've seen it with some of the weight loss weight loss medicines recently. We've seen it in other areas where people are approaching and buying medicines on the internet um, through routes which are not regulated and the risk of harm. And, and we see that with kind of fake medicines coming into the supply system um, and that and some of the risks. And, and every day now, I think the stories um, coming through the news around people who've been harmed by medicines that they've taken because they haven't actually gone through the legitimate processes for, for, for the prescribing and monitoring and control of those. So I think there is something about how we... Um, how we, I suppose, get some of those messages out to people about the kind of potential harm there um, and then the importance of us getting the clinical trial up and running as quickly as possible so that we actually can route people in through um, an area where we can then start to really collect the evidence um, around that. This, the, the, this is an area that emphasises again to me the needs for that broader holistic care. Um, package, um, or, and particularly the support package that exists around young people who are um, um, who, who are seeking help from, from the service to make sure that um, not only the supports are there but the education um, is, is there as well so that people are aware of, of these type of risks um, and, 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 and that they are uh, um, uh, not choosing to, 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 to use these routes which have potential harm uh, run about them. And I think that, 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 that um, that broader piece of work which has been done and led by, by NHS Glasgow, uh, which I think uh, you've heard in, in, in previous evidence uh, about understanding fully the, the, the broader needs of this um, community um, is really, really important so that that, 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 that that wraparound support is available to them as quickly as possible. That's great. Thanks, Camina. Joe Fitzpatrick. Thanks. Yavina, following on from uh, Gillian's questioning there, uh, Gillian mentioned that she had spoken to young trans people and that was where some of um, her questioning was coming from. Obviously, CAS was about children um, and, um, and that was the work that was done. There's a concern from some young uh, trans people that its reach is going further than just children, particularly in terms of the 17 to 24 age group, and that there's 
been the policy decisions that affect them. Um, so just whether, whether there has been policy decisions affecting 17 to 24 year olds um, and um, to, one of the suggestions is that Chalmers um, has paused um, gender affirming treatments um, for 17 to 24 year olds and what the decision making process around that is and you know, you know, is there a policy change and what, what can those young people expect for the future? So, so, so I'll start, and, I, and again, colleagues will want to come in here because they've been closer to some of the engagement with the, the, the boards who are actually delivering services just now, but there's been no policy change in relation to 17 to 24-year-olds at this point in time. Uh, I am aware um, that there are um, internal ongoing governance reviews within some of these areas who, that are looking at the way that they oversee or provide clinical oversight to, to some of these services, um, but, but there's certainly been no um, national policy change in, in, in relation to that. And, you know, um, let me be very explicit, CAS had a purpose, and CAS was looking at the services delivered to children and young people, and um, that, that, that's, that's, that's where we've concentrated um, the, the recommendations and the, the service development uh, steps that we referred to earlier in terms of that task and finish group um, for, the, um, uh, for, for the, the further development services for children and young people. But as I say, Professor Ellis may want to say a little bit more. Yeah, no, I would just underline that. We, we, we addressed purely children and young people services for under 18s. We made no reference to adult services and no reference to anything policy wise for 17 to 25 year olds. So there's, there's, no, there's no extension or bleed across to other areas that, I'm, that is part of what we've done. So, so young people are telling, I think, some, a number of the members that there has been a pause. They've, they've been told by Chalmers that there has been a pause on gender, gender affirming. Uh, treatments and is that so? Is that not true, or is that something you'd want to go away and have a look at? So, so I understand uh, that at this moment in time, um, NHS Lothian are reviewing internal governance procedures that, over, that surround that service, and that may have led um, to a pause in that service just now. I, I know that colleagues are engaging with NHS Lothian just now, just to further understand exactly uh, what the nature of that pause is and how long that's likely to be in place. But, but it's certainly not part of a national policy decision. Anything that can be done, I think, to, to um, get some transparency around that, I think would be really helpful because there's a number of people who are really concerned. But I think that's, that's helpful for now. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Kavira, and thanks to the panel for their comments so far. Um, some groups, such as the Good Law Project, have argued that the restriction of puberty blockers is causing harm to young trans people, citing an increase in deaths by suicide amongst this group. The Secretary of State for Health in England has commissioned a review of suicides and gender dysphoria in England, and that review concluded on five points, that the data does not support the claim that there has been a large rise in suicide in young gender dysphoria patients at the Tavistock Gender Identity Clinic. The way that this issue has been discussed on social media has been insensitive, distressing and dangerous, and goes against guidance on safe reporting of suicide. The claims that have been placed in the public domain do not meet basic standards for statistical evidence. There is a need to move away from the perception that puberty blocking drugs are the main marker of non-judgmental acceptance in this area of healthcare, and we need to ensure high-quality data in which everyone has confidence as the basis of improved safety for this at-risk group of young people. I'd ask the panel, has a similar review been commissioned in Scotland, or is there plans to commission a similar review in relation to this matter in Scotland? Good. So we haven't. So on the, if I can, there's quite a lot in that question. If I may, going back to the issue of suicide, I mean, this is a really important area for for really vulnerable young children and, and young people. So I think that we we want to make sure that we are supportive of them at a really high risk point in their lives. And I think it's important to underline the fact that no no evidence was there for an increase in suicide. Nevertheless, I think that we want to try and respond actively and proactively to people in need and in distress. I think the, the ban on puberty blockers, I mean, I think it's, it's a minority of children and young people currently on the waiting list who are looking to that particular treatment, but that doesn't mean that there are other needs, their concerns don't need addressed and supported. And it's worth underlining that the evidence is uncertain about the benefits of medication on the outcome of mental health and suicide, but it is a fundamentally important point that we ad adequately address in research and adequately address in our services. So I think our intent would be to to be more proactive in our wraparound support for these people and to recognise the distress that's there. But I, I think it would be, it, we would have to be very careful around um, some of the language that's used. And, and if, if there isn't evidence of a real increase in data on suicide, then I think we have to be very careful. I don't know if... I think you would support a 
inquiry in Scotland into this matter of the relationship between gender uh, services and suicide, increased suicide risk? So, so I think the, the so, so one of the things I would say in this space just now is 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 that the. The, the clinical validation review uh, that the NHS Greater Glasgow did uh, on people who were on their waiting list, I think, was um, in, in incredibly uh, uh, insightful in terms of the additional information that it began to dis uh, develop in terms of other um, ex you know, experiences of um, distress or, or other disease um, that, that children and young people had. Um, whilst awaiting assessment. And, and uh, Professor Ellis mentioned this earlier on, but, but, but actually the, um, the, the, the numbers of children and young people who were experiencing either mental health problems or um, thoughts of um, uh, whether they'd be passive or, or whatever of, of, of suicide ideation is really important for us to, to take up um, uh, notice of. I, I think th additionally, um, the, the uh, the experience of children and young people who um, turn to self-medication uh, to, to alleviate some of the distress in this space as well. All of these things need to be fully understood. Now, the starting point for that is that Greater uh, Glasgow uh, study, but I would hope um, that, that some of the, 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 the kind of research projects, and particularly um, the, 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 this, this wraparound multidisciplinary um, support, which is now being um, brought forward as part of the recommendations in which we spoke about uh, with Ms Mackay um, earlier on, has, has to be a, a critical part of the way that support is provided to these uh, children and young people in the future. Yeah, and I would just maybe add, I'm not sure a review would tell us anything very different to, to what came out from one that's been done elsewhere in the UK. And I think the important thing is that we actually put our energies and efforts into addressing the issues that that evidence is showing us and also what we know from, from the work that we've done around the CAS review and our considerations of it um, around how to respond in Scotland. And I think trying to get that multidisciplinary focused approach, thinking about those links into education are probably much better places for us to put our efforts than, than undertaking a review which in six months' time might point to the same thing. I can uh, one... Brief additional point. Um, just Professor Smith alluded to the, the work that Glasgow are doing in, in, in reviewing patients on the waiting list clinically, and that's highlighted a lot of the anxiety, depression, self-harm and suicide uh, thinking. But that isn't a passive process. They're then referred onward for services and support. So they are actively doing that for the current waiting list. But it's also an important reason that we've stopped self-referral into the service so that people can from their GP be identified as having issues that need addressed immediately and as a priority so that we, we can address that going forward. That's certainly helpful. It was just to turn to develop some of the points on monitoring harms. Uh, clearly that's been discussed so far. Um, Professor Smith, you mentioned that the nature of self-prescribing or, or self-medicating, sorry, uh, would be that it's done covertly or discreetly uh, without any open discussion. But certainly my experience I've had um, constituents who have approached me citing long waiting times to access the Sandiford and been quite open about the nature in which they are seeking to purchase medications online and so on. So there does seem to be a, a culture, certainly my experience anecdotally, of, of being quite open about the need to, or their need to, to self-medicate in this situation. So I wonder if there are opportunities to develop greater surveillance of that type of behaviour and the associated risks, perhaps in light of presentations to primary care practitioners on mental health issues or presentations to ADPs on you know, drug and alcohol dependency and so on, where that could be asked if, um, if it's a trans person who's seeking to self-medicate uh, in, in that scenario. Is there ways of developing greater monitoring to understand the, the scale of that behaviour? I am in no doubt that, 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 that there are a range of data uh, in relation to this that, that, that we need to develop. And in fact, that's one of the central recommendations uh, which was accepted, um, or at least partially accepted in, in Scotland. And again, Professor Ellis or Professor Strath may want to say just a little bit more about some of the consideration that was given on about data there. But actually making sure that we have adequate data sets both in Scotland, but which are comparable uh, with other countries so we can begin to benchmark um, uh, the care across uh, the, uh, different elements, particularly when it's um, a relatively small group of people in such a specialised um, area. 
um, ben benchmarking across borders is, is sometimes necessary in those terms. So, so developing data sets which tell us much more about the care experience um, and, 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 and some of the, the ancillary issues that people experience um, alongside the, the, the presenting. Uh, complaint um, is going to be really, really important in all of this. But, but um, as I say, that's one of the central recommendations that's been made by the multidisciplinary team to do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just to follow up on, on uh, Paul Sweeney's point there around the issue of, of, of you know, the dark side of potential suicides, etc. You talked very much, um, Professor Smith, around the, this, this need to have a much more wraparound, much more holistic uh, approach to uh, de dealing with, 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 with uh, this vulnerable group. But the reality is, you know, that, that's, which, is, which is great, it's exactly what we need, but the reality is, though, things like mental health services, you know, the access to that is you know, extremely difficult at the moment. Um, I mean, hearing from teachers saying that uh, you know, some of the lists uh, and uh, have closed in terms of being uh, access to mental health uh, up to five years. So, how how do we square that circle then? And because this is obviously a potentially you know significantly vulnerable group of young people who are looking for help, and reality, the reality is the help's not there. This is very complex care. This is very complex care that requires multidisciplinary um, approach uh, to the way that. Um, the care is provided, and um, I think the recommendations contained uh, within the report, which I've issued on CAS, um, are very clear that we need to develop those services and make sure um, that we have those in place for young people. Now, in order to do that, uh, we need to make sure that there's adequate workforce planning around about uh, gender identity services that encapsulates that whole um, uh, multidisciplinary team. That's that's um, something which uh, I would like to see taken forward with. Um, with a great degree of urgency, um, and, and um, as we've already heard, the Task and Finish Group, which is developing that service model, is beginning to to, to look at that as we speak. Um, but beyond that, the, 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 there's an additional element that I've touched upon that we need to uh, ensure is in place as well, because when I when I've spoken to clinicians who are working in this area just now, um, they, they, they they speak about the great difficulties that they have um, and the experience in, in in providing care. Um, partly because of that um, external discussion which takes place around about how these services are provided and so the toxicity that, that Cass has referred to in her report. So we need to change that dialogue because if we fail to change that dialogue in a societal perspective, and I think there's a responsibility, um, if I might say, on, 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 on Parliament to, to provide leadership in that space uh, to do that. If we don't, if we don't change that argument, or, 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 the, or the toxicity of that um, discussion, it is going to be very, very difficult to attract clinicians to work in that space in the future. So we need together, collectively, to make sure uh, that, 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 that we are making this a, 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 a much more uh, constructive approach to the way that we discuss care in this area. Otherwise, um, my great fear is, is that no matter how much work is put in place by the Task and Finish Group and by others trying to uh, develop a service which is um, fit and appropriate um, for, the, for, for people's needs within Scotland, that it will still be difficult to attract clinicians into this space if that toxic discussion which takes place at a societal level doesn't change. I was just maybe going to add in, at more of a micro than a macro level, uh, three things, I suppose. Uh, and I was really struck, as I'm sure my colleague uh, Professor Ellis was, in speaking to the clinicians involved in providing the service of the very, the very things that we've just heard described around their kind of the challenges that they faced every day in their work. And there was something around how we seek to address that. I think one of the key things for me in thinking about our recommendation around moving um, into kind of paediatric services, which isn't the best word to use for children and young people, but moving into that environment gives the opportunity for a much better multidisciplinary team approach to the care. And I think that can only be beneficial in terms of not putting pressure on one or two individuals out with of that, even though you do need somebody to take 
a lead, but the fact is you've got that multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach that's really important. And then I guess the third thing we've been doing is working with NHS Education for Scotland to think about what's the kind of knowledge and skills framework for everybody working within healthcare who will come across children and young people who might have questions around that, and I think around, around their gender identity or some of the feelings that they have. And that's really important whether you're a community pharmacist that somebody might come in and have a conversation with, a GP or somebody in another part of the health and, and social care system. And I think equally, you know, we've had the conversation about how important that is to replicate that over in health, because in education, so that we've actually got that kind of joined up approach. And I think they're the important things that we've got the opportunity in Scotland to, to really address in terms of taking this forward um, because of our size and because of the way we have, you know, good integrated working generally. Thank you. Thanks again. Um, just thinking about what you're saying about multidisciplinary teams and the minister announced when she gave the statement, it, it was in uh, 3rd of September 2024, that there was going to be a move to a more distributed network, a more regional model uh, with um, a, a multidisciplinary team approach, which you've described already. Can you tell us what a regional model would look like, especially when we struggle to staff um, services already? Do you mind if I come in on that point? Um, one thing that I think is also important, and it builds on what Professor Strath has said, is that um, Dr Katz described much of the care here being exceptionalised somewhere else, somewhere other. And actually what we want to do is to normalise that, bring that within the bounds of NHS evidence and of NHS governance, recruitment, training, support, etc. But one of the challenges with a, a single national service at the Sandiford in an exceptionalised setting is that it doesn't have capacity to meet the needs. It is too far away for people from the islands and from highlands. And there's a little bit of it still feeling exceptionalised in a national single centre. What we want to do is to mainstream it within child health services, whether that's in the community or in hospitals, but in a sense make it more normal, make it more accessible, make it more local. And in that setting, it's a lot easier to attract uh, someone for a session to do a clinic in an afternoon if, if they're on site. And, and as Dr Cass herself said, many of the skills from paediatrics and child health are transferable. This is not, this is normal child care. This is part of what, what needs to be normalised. So we think in that model it will be more accessible, more possible to retain, recruit, train, etc., and build up the quality and the accessibility. Um, in terms of the work of the Short Life Working Group and getting to that point as to how many centres, how local, how regional, there's a lot of that detail to be worked through because there's practicalities around where would you centre that, who would you recruit, how would they staff that, etc. So there's a lot to be worked through, but that's the intention. OK, and, um, and I forgot to be clear earlier, I am a former NHS uh, Scotland and NHS England employee, and I'm still a registered nurse. And, and I'm thinking about a multidisciplinary team uh, approach because we know that the skills required are specialist. So tell me who would be on that MDT. So the, the recommendation is that there would be uh, a psychiatry expertise, psychology, paediatrics in some form or other, depending on the need of the individual. There's been other suggested members of the team, including occupational therapy, physiotherapy, speech and language therapy. I think it very much depends on the need of that individual. And these are, we use the term multimorbid, but they're people with complex problems in more than one area of life, physical health, mental health, social life, might be experiencing bullying or trauma. They've often uh, had care experience in the system. So you need to have people who have the relevant expertise to deal with those facets of care at the same time. This isn't a single issue thing. And what we want to see is the development of the individual to thrive and be at their best and most able in terms of their, their progression. So the, the, the individual makeup of that team is, is still to kind of be worked through, but that's the recommendation that it's as broad as that and as normal as that. This is part of how we often do multidisciplinary care in other areas of paediatrics and in adult health. So just replicating that. Neuro neurodiversity and yes, knowledge and skills yes. regarding that because Absolutely. that's linked to this uh, um, gender dysphoria as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's key to that. There's a lot of, of unmet need there that needs recognised. I, I think that's one of the critical components here. I, th I really think it's one of the critical components that we need to make sure that we're addressing. Is, 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 and, and I think we would the only thing I would add to what Professor Ellis has 
um, very completely kind of described there is, is, is the recognition that that multidisciplinary team will change over time as well, according to the needs of any individual. And people will come in to the team or out of the team as it's necessary for that individual. Personalising the care in that way f for that person's needs is a, an important aspect of this. Actually underpins the way that we should be providing complex care to anyone in Scotland. Okay, just a final question, um, convener. Um, has the decision to stop self-referrals had any impact on the length of the waiting list? It may be too early for us to know that in terms of the data. We know that the waiting list has come down slightly, but Greater Glasgow and Clyde are actively involved in uh, looking at clinical discussions with individuals on that waiting list. The, the numbers who were self-referring were just under half of those who are currently on the waiting list. But the, the retrospective approach that they're taking is making sure that they identify any unmet needs that they have and plugging them into services, uh, which should be done from the start, but they're, they're doing now. Thanks. Thank you. It's Anders Gohani. Thank you, convener. I have two questions, if I may. I'd like to build on, a, on questions that Emma Harper was asking, um, because, uh, Professor Ellis, you said that the MDT would include a psychiatrist. Um, we know from comparative studies that transgender young people are about four times more likely to think about attempting suicide. Um, and later stats also show that over 7,000 children and young people had their referrals rejected from CAMS in 2023. That's an average of 26 children a day being rejected. So how are you going to get psychiatry involved in this MDT if we can't provide basic services at the moment to children around our country? So psychiatry are already involved currently, and I don't think necessarily that it will be that challenging to extend their involvement and capacity in this. In terms of your comment about their figures uh, on CAMS, I mean, I can't speak to that. I, I, I suspect the word rejected means that, that, that actually they no, they no longer need the appointment or that there are other explanations for why that term was used. But I, I, I think that it is possible and it is essential that we increase our capacity on this front. But I don't think... Um, given that the numbers in this particular area are relatively small compared to the overall numbers needing uh, psychiatry involvement, I don't think this will be particularly challenging. Okay. Uh, Professor Smith, um, hospitals are pushing more and more to GPs, I would say that being a GP. Um, standards as written show the ability for gender services to push prescribing to GPs. And I've been speaking to many GPs, uh, and they are very concerned and a lot not comfortable with prescribing puberty blockers. Uh, some of the reasons, off-licence, awaiting robust evidence, there's no formal protocol, RCGP supports GPs not taking on shared care, the potential to, for litigation uh, if patients decide that puberty blockers are harming them, given Prof Ellis told us one in two patients for underlying mental health issues, the GMC tell us that prescribing must be appropriate, uh, and if these issues are not addressed, are we following GMC competence? So, could you reassure me that puberty blockers will not be pushed into primary care without GPs who have credentialed in this and want to take it on, and that GPs are all able to opt out? Well, clearly there's no uh, decision yet being made about puberty blockers, GNRH analogues, and how they'll be used in the future. So I think we're talking about a very theoretical space here just now. But RCGP are fully involved in the discussions in relation to this and will continue to be involved in the, in the discussions in the future. So I, I think that's all I can really say in this space just now. I may just add in, uh, we have just recently introduced directions which um, has... I suppose put a safety net around the prescribing of GN GNRH analogues in primary care. So uh, they now sit on the selected list. So the, you know a GP would have to actively choose to prescribe them. So we put some some safety measures in there. Um, but I, I think, as as my colleagues just said, I think the important thing will be that you know as decisions are made, you know there will be options there to think about what. Further, do you need to do to ensure that the prescribing is, is appropriate? But we certainly have um, followed on a UK basis the, the ability, the, the, the use of directions to restrict prescribing right now in general practice. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to turn to the issue of conversion therapy, which was touched on by the cast in the context of the CAST report. Um, and I'm aware that the Scottish Government has announced it's seeking a UK-wide approach um, with regards to that. So I wonder if it is it possible for the panel to, to give the committee an update on progress towards a UK-wide approach in banning conversion therapies or practices? 
Uh, I, I'm not able to give you a, uh, an update myself. One of the colleagues would be able to speak uh, to that. Yeah, uh, so there is obviously a policy within the Scottish Government being developed around this. I'm not, I'm not so au well fait with the kind of UK-wide approach to this. And obviously uh, we would support Dr Cass's comment around uh, conversion therapy concerns, but uh, I'm not aware of the timescales around that, um, so apologies. Well, if I may say one thing in relation to, to kind of conversion therapy in this space, I mean, um, many people will have been have followed the, some of the concerns that have been raised around about um, uh, the ban on conversion therapy and how that will impact on people. Uh, being supported um, through this process just now, and um, I think it's really important to say that um, I, I, I see that, that that professional support and discussion of a person going through um, gender identity uh, treatment as, as as being very different. Um, and uh, one of the things that I uh, would certainly be um, keen to ensure in the discussions um, that are taking place just now is that there are adequate protections for professionals to have appropriate discussions uh, to be able to, to kind of support people um, who are experiencing gender identity issues at this this moment in time. And, and I see that as being uh, very separate from the discussions uh, which have we've all previously had in relation to conversion therapy, which uh, for me feels very much a... Um, Something which is 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 done to people, uh, rather than a discussion that is had with people. Thank you for that, um, Professor Smith. You've gone on and answered what my next question was going to be. <laughs> um, so taking back to to um, my previous question about um, the UK a UK approach, it would be helpful if perhaps uh, you could write to the <coughs> committee about what discussions have been going on um, regards to that. What I'll commit to do is to engage with officials who are overseeing this part uh, and, and, and for them to be able to, to kind of give you an update on that themselves. We're not directly involved in that. That's absolutely fine to, um, if the committee gets an update from officials or, or minister from yourself. Um, you've also touched on what was going to be my third question, which was about um, some of the areas that you've, you've spoken about in terms of toxicity around about the discussions about gender identity services. And we've heard from previous panels about the difficulties that they've had in recruiting staff, um, which then consequently has an impact on waiting lists and, and will no doubt have an impact on um, anyone who's on that waiting list, regardless whether they're a child and, and a young person or an adult. And you've sort of touched a little bit on what you think would um, assist in... Um, perhaps making a, a career in gender identity services or a role there perhaps more attractive to health and social care um, professionals. But I'm wondering if um, if there's anything else that you could add in terms of that sort of workforce planning um, and support for staff uh, to encourage them to consider working in gender identity services, particularly in the new multidisciplinary teams that are being proposed? I don't think we should mistake that there aren't an awful lot of really motivated clinicians who want to work in this area. And I've come across them and I've spoken to them, I've had conversations with them. And people are really committed to providing care in this area. But it is difficult. We, we must acknowledge that it's difficult. So as we develop a workforce for the future, it's my view that as we develop that, we've got to make sure that we've got the supports in place for people to do what is a, a really challenging job. Now, collectively in this room, I think that we also have a responsibility as well. And I, I guess um, if I was to ask anything of the committee, I, I, I would ask for your leadership in making sure that we have a different dialogue about services and care in this area, uh, that, that actually we lead um, a, a different dialogue for society that, that is perhaps more tolerant of some of the differences that, that, that people experience in this area. And if we can do that, I think we create a different environment for people who have that motivation to come in and work in this area uh, to provide that, that type of care. Um, I, I, I think that this this this, this, is, this is a very complex and wide problem. It's not just here in Scotland that we experience it. It's experienced um, um, nationally across the UK and internationally to that respect as well. 
But we've got the ability to be able to change that, that, that national dialogue around about this uh, in a way. And, and I guess I ask for, 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 for collectively your leadership in assisting us to do that, to make this uh, a place where, where, where we can attract the workforce and uh, to provide the care that they want to provide. And I should put on record that I hold a back nurse contract with Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS. I haven't done that at the start. Um, can I thank the panel for their evidence this morning? Um, I'm sure the committee has found that very helpful in our uh, deliberation over the CAS review. At our next meeting on the 5th of November, we will commence taking oral evidence as part of the committee's stage one scrutiny of the assisted dying for terminally ill adults Scotland bill. And that concludes the public part of our meeting today. <laughs>